intraosseous procedure. Cartilage does not have enough blood supply. Once you start wearing out, then you lose it. Before we had no treatment. Stage four was always surgery. Just because it's a deformed bone does not mean you need surgery. How we traditionally used to treat the joints, we used to inject the meniscus. If we can inject the bone under the cartilage, we're going to get the uh, results in a much better fashion. By doing this procedure, you're literally avoiding that potential surgery in most of the patients. This is going to alter how we look at surgeries also. Hello, sir. Thanks for your time. So, sir, we just wanted to know, like, you're an expert in intra-articular procedures, minimal invasive procedures, but now the new thing of intra-osseous procedure. Sure. So, can you just brief something about that? Yeah, so there is also a different name for it called subchondral procedures. So, intra-osseous, you know, the name itself tells you that you go inside the bone. How we traditionally used to treat the joints non-surgically is using bone marrow stem cells. So everybody's familiar with that thing. For example, let's take the knee. So, so knee cartilage damage, arthritis, right? So we used to inject the cartilage. We used to inject the meniscus. And now what we figured out now, because of what's going on now means in the recent times, we figured out not only the cartilage, if we can inject the bone under the cartilage, we're going to get the uh, results in a much better fashion. The reason for that, cartilage does not have enough blood supply, right? Once you start wearing out, then you lose it. So it's not able to replenish it by itself. But where does the cartilage get its blood supply or nutrients? From the underlying bone. So subchondral, like uh, you have the cartilage, you have the hard plate of the cortical bone, and underneath subchondral. That's where all the blood vessels, nutrients, um, everything is there. So imagine if we replenish that area, see we inject cells into that area, then the results of the cartilage regeneration is much, much higher. The inflammation will go down and the effect of the procedure is amplified you know, compared to before. So just to follow up on to this, as you mentioned, we go subchondrally. Mm -hmm. So is it only for like local subchondral defects or like a global cartilage damage like an arthritic condition? Arthritic condition is where um, now our focus is. In the past, we used to go subchondrally in a local area because there are certain bones where you have the death of the bone, uh, like a navicular bone here, even scaphoid. So we used to go subchondrally into that local area inject. Now we're talking global arthritis, like for example, the whole knee, right? So mostly the medial compartment. So when we go subchondrally, you're going literally the whole entire surface of that thing. So we inject globally in that area, along with the cartilage. So both areas will be covered. So can this also be used for conditions like avascular necrosis of the femur head and the other things? Absolutely, yeah. So avascular necrosis of the femoral head is very common. Uh, we see post-COVID conditions now. So this is the mechanism we used to use. Okay. For, for the hips first, we used to go uh, into the bone and you have to address the lesion. Then we also go into the joint, right? Now, similar methodology, we're doing it in the knees. And that's where the, the game-changing effects are seen, basically. Because you don't need to have avascular necrosis in order to go into the bone. So in the knees, for example, arthritis, they don't have avascular necrosis, but they have deformed bone, deformed cartilage. In those cases, if you go into the bone and the cartilage, then the results have been excellent. So what are the indications of this procedure? Sir? Stage one, for example, very minimal damage to the uh, joint. We may not need to go subchondrally because if they have a preserved cartilage, but they just have little cuts, you know, say a meniscus tear or, or ligamentous tear, we may not need to go into the bone. We can just go into the area of the cartilage or ligaments and we can inject it. Results have been uh, pretty good. But once you start having uh, advanced arthritis, okay. stage two, stage three, even to a degree of stage four also, before we had no treatment. Stage four was always surgery. Stage three, borderline. But now stage two and threes, 
where not only the cartilage is getting damaged, you also see the bone end plate changes. Yes. You see deformities, bone spurs, subchondral cysts are also seen. So in those cases, this was excellent, basically. So now we go into the bone, stage two, stage three, and we are potentially avoiding any kind of surgery for these patients. Before, it was borderline, right? Stage one and two, stem cells, great. When you go to four, surgery. But now even those patients can consider these procedures. So basically you're telling that these procedures are like a better option than a surgery even in the end or the severe conditions of arthritis or degeneration. Absolutely. Because you always have to consider this as a viable option yes. before thinking the surgery is the only option. Now we can. We can potentially and we are seeing good results in, in those. There are some cases if it's completely bone on bone and uh, there's no space left absolutely go for surgery. Just because it's a deformed bone does not mean you need surgery. You can get better with these things. Deformed bone, as you mentioned. So can some assistive devices with this a better option? Bracing, unloading, bracing. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, um, you know, helping with the unloading, uh, offloading braces will help you uh, uh, maintain a good alignment, take the pressure off the joint until you build your own muscle structure. If you don't build your muscle strength, you know, no, no matter how many devices you use is, is going, to be the, going to work. But uh, bracing, assistive device, along with the muscle strengthening, uh, will make a huge change. Yeah. So what are the benefits of this procedure, sir? I mean, once we understand why we are doing this thing, then we know the benefits. So as I mentioned, the cartilage uh, is relatively avascular. Right, arthritis is losing the cartilage. When you lose the cartilage, your bones start getting together. So now, by doing this procedure, you're literally avoiding that potential surgery in most of the patients. So that's a great advantage. And um, the other advantages are, even though you don't have a, a, a stage of that, by doing this thing, making your joint healthy, you are proactively preventing a future surgery. Or, or even arthritis. So there's tremendous advantage uh, looking into this technology. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, like uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, clinical applications in a lot of patients, as well as we have done multiple studies uh, in these things. But the, but the biggest breakthrough study uh, that came in from France, Dr. Hernagou, has done a 15-year-old study. 15 years is too long. I mean, that is that will tell you. It's not like a one-year study, two-year study. 50 years, he has done study, almost 200 patients, uh, by doing a subchondral intraosseous injection of the patient's own stem cells, bone marrow, as well as into the joint. And even he compared with the total knee replacements. So there are a few set of patients where they had a TKR on one side and the subchondral on, one, on the other side, 15-year study has proven to have excellent results with the, with the subchondral injection, even comparable to a total knee replacement and sometimes even getting better. So the studies have, are, are there and also clinically we see great improvements. So um, we kind of make it a more standard of care nowadays and uh, we're glad like uh, we're able to bring the technology here. So can you just brief us what are the steps of the procedure because we know intraarticular procedures are like walk in, walk out. So any differences in that, in that, sir? Yeah. So intraosseous procedures, subchondral procedures are also outpatient. So there's not much downtime, uh, but it's slightly different than a regular intraarticular procedure. So there is a, a need for a nerve block uh, of the knee has to happen because while injecting into the bone can be painful if you're not giving any kind of uh, um, uh, support of, with the pain. So either whether you sedate the patient or you do a little bit of local anesthesia, that should be plenty enough. And once the procedure is completed, which can take up to 20, 30 minutes, patients are able to um, bear weight, walk, just like a regular intraarticular procedure. Then they, there is no residual pain after. It's not like they have pain next day or next day. It's only during that time, and we take care of it by doing all the nerve blocks. And uh, it is a tolerable procedure. Uh, it is not a surgery. So it is still a procedure only. So it is, uh, I would say, very minimally, maybe minimal discomfort is what you see. Can we treat other joints also with the same techniques uh, or the same treatment? 
you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. We were treating even other joints, same technique, but we're treating um, in a localized area. As I mentioned, like if you have a avascular necrosis or osteochondral defects, yes. you know, when you have a little bit of a chip that goes on, we were treating this way in the past. So obviously knee comes as the main joint and we have a lot of uh, uh, patients that have similar problems with the shoulders and uh, they have the avascular lesions and we're able to treat the shoulders similarly. So very common, obviously hips, we mentioned about it, hips is uh, common. Um, so the major joints, now the hips, shoulders, knees, we treat it and as I said, even in ankles, you know, if you have a, um, there are certain bones that have don't have enough blood supply and they need to be treated in the bone, like uh, navicular bone, or bones, uh, talus bones, uh, actually. And uh, even in the wrist, the uh, scaphoid bones can have the same problem. Uh, so literally, they apply for most of the joints uh, in your body. So it's something uh, we're very excited about. And uh, still, it's still in the, you know, in the realm of a non-surgical yes, uh, outpatient procedure. Uh, it is still not a surgery. So that's why we're super excited. We're able to offer that to the patients nowadays. So like intra, like simple intraarticular bone marrow transplantations are very easy in and out. Mm. And those are suitable for high risk cases. Mm. Like someone has gone like CBGs, like complications, yes. little surgery, where they are not suitable for surgery. Can those patients or subjects undergo this? Yeah, see, there is no added risk to the patient at all. No I mean, so no added risk compared to if somebody is uh, a candidate for an injection, he will be a candidate for intraosseous procedure because it is not invasive. It is still as an outpatient and there is no skin cutting at any point. It's still a needle procedure only. So there is no added risk. It does not create any added risk than compared to a, a general intraarticular procedure. So the minor side effects like, you know, bleed, bruise, redness, no, those can happen, but nothing like a major surgical side effects are not seen at all. Yeah. So can we consider this as a future of regenerative medicine? Not only future, as I said, like, you know, Dr. Hernog has been doing for 15 years and we've been doing for the last couple of years uh, as well, or even longer in some cases. Uh, we ourselves are seeing tremendous uh, difference uh, between these procedures versus the traditional uh, intraarticular procedures. So, yeah, absolutely. It's a game changer. I mean, not only in regenerative, this is going to alter how we look at surgeries also. Mm -hmm. So now even a surgical candidate can seriously think about a non-surgical procedure uh, because of this technology.